Word First Radio. Hey, what's up, you guys? Welcome to Word First Radio, the podcast brought to you by Word First Ministries. I am your host, Jacob O'Neill, and as always, I'm joined by my friend Cameron. Hey. And today, on Christine is back with us. Woo! Yeah. To continue Hello. our to continue our series on uh, this book by Kari Weitzberg, Sture Sprossmann, Kurt Schwart. And today is when the rubber hits the road. Uh, anyone who wanted woo. us, to, anyone who wanted us to dig in the book last time, uh, we're actually going to start doing that here. So, real quick, um, let's explain maybe just in a little bit more detail what this book is. Uh, I don't, I guess not how it came about, but what yeah. is this book trying to accomplish? Yeah, I love it. I I love conceptually what she sets out to do. I think is great. So the idea mm-hmm. is. Uh, she's the Bishop of Oslo. She travels. She talks to a lot of young people. And so she decided to compile the questions that she receives the most often and give s- short, simple, concise answers to them. Because just about every question in the book could be a volume. You could, and some of the questions, volumes have been written. Mm-hmm. And so, she, but she's taking people's, they're big questions that you might expect to require nuanced and significant and could make very long answers about, but just to give a, to give a quick, easy to understand. And that's what, uh, Stuart Sprochmal Kottesvaj is big questions, short answers, and to give short answers to big questions that at least I think, um, pique people's interest, whet their appetites, or give an idea about like, what do Christians believe? Like what's the Christian worldview? What do Christians believe about these about these kinds of questions, which that's actually one of the main reasons we have lots of reasons that we asked on Christine to be on the thing, but she does, she subjects herself to this all the time mm-hmm. where she has to give short answers to big questions from young people. So we thought, wow, she's, she's got to be at least as good as Kari Vaitabedege is at this. <laughs> but I, I love that. I wish maybe someday, I, I don't think that I'm smart or wise enough to be able to answer questions well, but if I like, this is the kind of project I would love to pursue. I think it's, I think it, it's valuable and um, I think it's a good thing to have. It's easy to read. It's a, it's, it, even for, we read it in Norwegian. and That's what I was going to say, yeah. language goals for us. Me and Cameron have read the entire book yeah. uh, and it was in Norwegian. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I cheated a little bit just to understand some oh, things. I couldn't, Jake, I know Louise. you did too. Don't even start. I did not cheat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we... Read it all in Norwegian, which was pretty great. Yeah. Nice language uh, win for us. Yeah. It was easy for you to, to read in Norwegian, wasn't it, on Christina? Yeah. yeah okay. I feel it was written like really simple. Yeah. So sure, uh, sure. everybody can understand what she's saying. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's excellent. I think compiling those kinds of questions from those kinds of people and then giving answers that are easy, that are short and easy to understand, I think that is an excellent and laudable goal. Um, I'm all about that. Yeah, and it is like short because I feel like if I was supposed to uh, answer all these questions, mm-hmm. I feel like, oh, but I'm not saying enough. So I uh, think it was hard to write it this yeah. short that she asked. Them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think anyone who's ever written like a theology paper with a strict word count can, can attest to like, oh, wow, this, when they, when the, a uh, professor assigns a assignment that you only have 3,000 words to answer. You really do only have 3,000. Yeah. And that's clearly not enough for lots of questions. Mm-hmm. Even some of these questions, that's not even enough. So uh, we've all read the book. Um, and we, uh, well, we've, we have some notes. We've uh, had some time to digest our thoughts about the book, just kind of overall. Before we get into some specific questions, we will, don't worry, anyone who's listening, don't worry about it. Uh, what are our general impressions about the whole book, just in general? So I mean, I'll start. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wish it was better. Hmm. So I, I don't want to um, be too sort of pedantic, like you just said, like, like, and I, like I kind of said, each of these questions definitely deserves or there's space for a very thorough and long answer because they, they're um, the question, they all touch other stuff, right? So uh, I won't, I won't do any spoilers right now, but one, like any one of those questions, the answer touches other stuff and it could be long, long, long answers. So, but the, my point is not just that the answer that I think the answer are too short, but what I'm not trying to say is I wish she would have answered this in a huge theological treatise, mm-hmm. but the way that I understand the, the, there are some themes I think 
that emerge with her answers. One of them that was kind of that was disappointing to me is it seems like her perspective is um, really local. So like mm. her answer to those questions are to the questions tend to be very personal and don't really require anything on behalf of the reader. So so when we're dealing with important like if, so we're here, Jacob, you and I as missionaries, people who want to plant a church, persuade people that that um, Jesus is the salvation and uh, Jesus uh, offers us salvation and reconciliation to God and that you can be really adopted as a member of God's family and spend eternity with him instead of eternity without him. Like we believe those things are true for everybody. Mm-hmm. And it's important, uh, just like if we had the cure for a disease, very important that everybody knows it and that everybody is given the cure so they don't die of this disease. And the impression that I get, I don't, I don't want to be too accusatory, but the way that I read all of those answers is not like what Cotty has is a cure for disease, but sort of she just has a way of thinking about things. And it's like she's, te- she's talking about her perspective from inside her own story mm-hmm. and doesn't have much to say about whether that story applies to anybody, anybody else, which, you know, those uh, uh, people, would, you might call that a, a postmodern worldview. Yeah. It's like, so I have this local story, but there's not a meta story that applies to everybody where we're all living in the same, we're all living in the same story. And mm-hmm. here's what it looks like from my perspective. But it's like, here's my, here's my story. And, um, you might have your own story, mm-hmm. but I'm explaining what mine is like. There, there was this thought you shared, uh, earlier in our pre podcast meeting, um, about this, where she seems to kind of treat the questions of, is this true? And I believe mm-hmm. as different questions. Yeah, it seems like and those come apart. It's not clear to yeah. me that if uh, when somebody says, what do you think about this? And she says, I believe mm-hmm. X. It doesn't seem to me that she means the same thing as it is true that X. Yeah. So saying X is true and I believe X. Right. Those uh, ba- based on the way that I read the question, then forgive me if I get this wrong, but I think I'm right about that. But it seems like those are separate questions. Mm-hmm. So something like, what do you believe about the resurrection? Well, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, is it true that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, hang on. I'm not saying that, Mm -hmm. but I'm telling you about my beliefs and I I believe he did rise from the dead. And for me and the way that I view the world and my, my way of interacting with reality, do you believe and is it true are essentially the same question. Yeah. So that's really helpful. Or at least I would answer them the same way. Do you believe X? Yes. Is X true? Yes. That's why I believe it. Yeah, well, it's really good because, I mean, noticing that that trying to make those distinctions between what I believe versus what is true um, is pretty much definitional to like a postmodern worldview just yeah. kind of anyways. And so it's interesting uh, that you notice that because that can be really helpful in trying to navigate through this book. So thanks for mm-hmm. that, Cam. On Christine, what are your general impressions of the book? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, she's she's been good to keep it short and uh, try to answer on those questions she Mm. picked out Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, answer what they are saying because as working as I am working with Guilla Christian Mm. uh, it is uh, really important to answer the questions and not think that okay but maybe you mean this so then Mm. I should answer this and stuff like that. I feel like the questions she has picked up picked out she is at least trying to answer directly to them Uh, and that I think it is important but some places I maybe wish she picked uh, another question Mm. or um, formulated it formulated it yeah Yeah. a different formulation of the question yeah Yeah, yeah. a a different formulation of the questions Mm. because I believe it is questions she's gotten from many people uh, all over uh, and that they are asked differently from place to place. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then she just took like, okay, this, but this question I got specific. So therefore Mm -hmm. I pick pick to answer that in this book, but I would Mm -hmm. wish uh, of her to take like, okay, this is like more of the overall team. Mm. So then I think this question or this formulation on that question is better. Yeah. Uh, so I think she couldn't have done that a little bit differently. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, all over, I think she's 
uh, have some uh, good points mm -hmm. uh, in many of the questions, but uh, I wouldn't say I agree to everything she yeah. is writing. Sure. And, I think I, I think yeah. overall, found, overall found that there's some there's some valuable insights and some things I think even as Jacob and I, who come from a very conservative theologically speaking background, mm -hmm. um, stuff that I think we are uh, we would be wise to incorporate and to understand and to allow some influence. Um, I, th I think that's good. And I also appreciate uh, on Christine, you said maybe she, she has all these questions and maybe there's a better formulation or a way to like pick the question so that the answer is more universal or something. And I completely agree with that. And I also appreciate, and she says it in her introduction, that she doesn't judge whether the questions are sincere or not. So she's like, sure. I've got all these questions. And I don't say, ah, that one seems like a joke question, so I'm not going to answer it. Like she takes them seriously and she, she takes people at their word and says, okay, this is a question that I'm getting. I'm going to take it as serious and answer it as such. Um, but then still in, inside of that, it's, it seems like there could be more universal answers that have to do more with what should a person be like? What should a person believe? Mm -hmm. Then uh, maybe a personal survey, like tell me your your opinions or your um, your perspective on this certain thing. I just said that really badly, but right. Well, yeah. I mean, there's because um, what we personally believe, right, or how we approach a certain question in a very personal kind of way uh, is important, and we're de definitely not trying to say that it's not important. But I think uh, a point that Aunt Christine was trying to make or, or did make was that there are sides of these questions that can be formulated in ways that don't uh, just talk about what you personally believe about them, but what is true in the world, or what, what's true about this subject for everybody. And uh, there's a way that you can formulate the questions uh, to address that side of it. And the, our point is that both are important. It, it's important what you personally believe about this and how mm -hmm. it touches you personally. And it's important how this touches everybody and how is this true or false for everybody? How yeah. does it interact with everyone's life? Yeah, and I think the first yeah. question in the book is a great example of that. Yeah, and so we're going to talk about... Thank you for that segue, Cam, because you're just about to start it's talking about It's not a segue that. if you call it one. You're just <laughs> supposed to roll with it. So the first question, uh, I'm going to translate this into English, right, is do you wish that life is eternal? Something like that. Aunt yeah. Christine is going to go ahead and correct any kind of translation. Yeah, would you give us an a, give us an official Norwegian to English translation of that? <laughs> <laughs> we were actually well, just talking about we, it. Before. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. And yeah, I, I said that. I would translate it with "Do you wish uh, yeah. that life is it eternal?" Uh, but uh, Jacob would translate it with should you wish that life yeah. is eternal. So we're definitely going to defer to your translation, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah. I was, uh, I, but I did translate it the way that she said I did, uh, just because there's a word that begins the sentence that uh, could be an equivalent to the word should or should you in yeah. English. And so that's why I was translating it that way. But well, I, go ahead, Cam. Yeah, so we were, talking yeah. About, we, wanted, we were just talking about this a few minutes ago. Like, yeah. What's the best way to understand this question? And yeah. we all landed in a place where like, okay, the, the question as such sounds like it's asking of personal opinion. Something like, uh, uh, would you wish that life lasts forever? Something like that. Yeah. And her answer to that question is like, yeah. I mean, I read in the Bible that, that, that God's going to make a new heaven and earth and that mm -hmm. we're going to live forever in a world without, uh, without suffering and sorrow. Yeah. Which is fine as far as it goes. But I think, I won't say all of us agree. I don't want to put you guys on the hook for something you didn't say. So I'll just say it about myself. I had wished that either the, the formulation she would have taken of that question is, does life last forever? And that she yeah. would answer that. Because what we get is a very concise, just like a two-sentence answer to the question, which is fine as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't... I don't, it answers that question, but not the question from sure. my, uh, that, that I would expect it to be answering. Yeah. Right? If someone asked me, do you want life to l last forever? I'd be like, yeah, for those who are in God's family, that's the greatest thing that you can imagine is life that lasts forever. Mm -hmm. But those who are separated from God, like most of us are right now, eternal life is a terrifying thing to consider because it means I don't get God and I don't get, hmm. uh, I don't get to experience all of those positive attributes of God. So there's more than one orthodox way, I think, of conceiving of what, what hell is but none of them are good and Jesus is serious right. about avoiding them. So my, so that's not to say that Kari Vaita, but she didn't answer it the same way that I would. So I think it's a bad answer. Not, not like that, mm -hmm. but 
if a student, if I'm getting grilled and a student says, do you want life to last forever? Like I'm answering that question. And it's something that I think we both would have to contend with. Like, I th- mm-hmm. yes, life is eternal and it's a matter of how you spend that eternal life. And that's why I'm a Christian. That's why I'm here getting grilled and talking to you about these things. And Cotty's answer left me a little bit unsatisfied mm-hmm. and sets up what I think is the theme that I noticed through the book, which is she answers sort of like, what does, what the question could be, what does your story say about eternal life? Mm-hmm. And she goes, oh, well, my story says about eternal life that God's going to make a new one someday and there's going to be no suffering. And so I believe that. Yeah. And then what does that mean for me? I don't think that it's clear that there's a, that there's another, that there's any, any more information coming about. So what does that mean for me? Yeah. Um, and we, I, I think throughout the book, we don't really get that. Okay. So, mm-hmm. okay. So the, the, like, and to me, that's like where the important part of the question is not what's your <laughs> opinion or, or give yeah. me a literary analysis of your story that tells me about what, like, according to the rules yeah. of your story, what is whatever. But I think that what that question gets at is someone's asking, mm-hmm. is life last forever? Well, they're both important. And, uh, and I think that that's, um, uh, that's kind of our point in the beginning. So if the question is formulated in such a way that what's asking is, do you, Kari Weiterberg, want to live forever or do you ho- wish that life is everlasting? Um, the answer to that is not unimportant. Right. It's important what Kari Weiterberg wants, it, it, if mm-hmm. she even wants to live forever with God and Jesus. Of course, that's important. Um, but I kind of lean, uh, you know, more more in how, like if I was at a guerrilla Christian and asked yeah. this question, I would kind of answer it kind of more uh, along the lines that you were just talking about. Like I would take this question and think like, okay, let me take what I believe about this and translate it or, uh, to a, to a more universal principle that yeah. can apply to, to all of us. And, um, yeah, she, her, she ends it with, uh, something like, let me try and translate it on the fly. She goes, uh, there's going to be a new world without pain and suffering. And I think that's nice. And I believe that. Yeah. Which is, I'm good. Which I'm, is, hap- that's I'm fine. happy that she yeah. believes that. Um, but I, but I think that there was, Kind of what you said, Cam, when you were like, I was, I left a little unsatisfied. Mm-hmm. I kind of wanted just a little bit more. It didn't have to be a very long explanation more. could have just been like another couple sentences um, where she was like, this is, this is why eternal life is something that you can want mm-hmm. or you should want too. Um, yeah. And that's what we were yeah. talking about is we're trying to conceive of the question. Right. We're like, what is she answering? Is she answering, should a person want to live forever? Mm-hmm. Or is she answering... Do you wish that life is a, is a true? What do you think on Christine? Yeah. Oh, set us straight. <laughs> we need you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think you both came off with r- really good points. And uh, I believe she is asked, like, personally, what do you think right here? Uh, but uh, I would probably s- also say that I didn't want this life to uh, be eternal because mm-hmm. this isn't a life with God or it is with God mm-hmm. but not mm-hmm. only God mm-hmm. uh, and uh, what's only good um, yeah uh, but I think she's when it is coming to this question she is answering it right and mm-hmm. uh, uh, that if she was going to answer with uh, like, oh, and I believe that uh, this is true for you and uh, for everybody and stuff like that, she is, had answered more than the question yeah. was asking. Yeah, sure. Mm. Uh, so uh, I feel it's hard when it's just on paper and mm. uh, like you can't feel the situation and mm. what people are, as- are asking. But if I had been there on our grilling, uh, I would see the person asking the question and then I could understand, okay, does he or she want to know what I uh, think Mm -hmm. about eternal life or does she or he want to know what Christianity says about it and if it is true for everybody or stuff like that. So. I feel she is answering the question, but I would like her to have picked another question that mm-hmm. was more overall or talking about it overall. Right. Yeah. And it's easy for me to be in like apologist mode. Uh, so to, mm. to, to see the question that the, something like, do you wish that life would be eternal? And I don't, it doesn't occur to me for a moment that that's a personal question. I think the question is, is life eternal? And then I go into, yes, it is. Mm-hmm. And let me prove it to you and tell you why it's important. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, just a certain impulse of mine that I, I think it's good for me to learn to be aware of. 
Right. And speaking of apologist mode, because I think one of the reasons I uh, read the question the way that I did is because that is a question I'm asked a lot yeah. w- by atheists to be like, well, eternal life sounds terrible. That is, <laughs> they said, like the idea of living forever and never mm-hmm. just ultimately dying or ceasing to exist sounds like total torture to me. Right. There's a couple, it's like an a eth- classic atheist line or new atheist line that goes around these days. And so I'm kind of, um, uh, calibrated towards that kind of right. line of thinking, and so that's that's where my brain goes when yeah. I hear that. And so maybe we, I can learn to be more relational. Maybe that's more of a like relating to one another question and trying to understand mm-hmm. how you look at the world and how you think about things. When I want to get into like, let's do math about this mode and yeah. prove prove to you, you know, yeah. Yeah, maybe it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so really cool. Um, let's go ahead and just move on to this next question. This is a uh, oh my gosh, this is. This could be its own podcast episode in itself, but we're uh, trying to give a short answer to a big question. <laughs> so um, this is the next question. Uh, I'm going to translate it to English, and on Christine could correct me if I'm getting it wrong. But the question is, is God a boy or a girl? We got a thumbs up. We got a thumbs up from the yes. translation committee. Translation yeah. approved. <laughs> okay, so is God a boy or a girl? How does she answer this question? Because I'm... I'm a little confused by her answer personally. Um, and so what are, what are your guys' impression about how she answers this question? Mm, yeah, uh, I think it is a good beginning, uh, mm-hmm. first of all, because she is uh, taking that God created uh, both uh, boys and girls mm-hmm. and that uh, everybody is created in his image. Uh, I think that's really good and... Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, good that she started with that. But uh, after, she's just talking about, okay, how is he in the Bible uh, or which words is used on in, in the Bible? And then she's taking uh, that it, it is most Abba or um, dad mm. or he. Uh, and uh, that in the Old Testament, it is Yahweh or Adonia. Nay, mm-hmm. Adonai. Adonai. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, that is Hebrew, and that the Jews didn't want to use Yahweh, so therefore they used Adonai. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, it comes more words because, or what people are calling God because of who, uh, how he interacts with them. Then he gets more names on what he, he is. But. Mm. Uh, I feel like uh, Kari should uh, have more of that God is, or it is used he about God Mm -hmm. most of the times when he's talked about. Like uh, he also gets um, the um, mm, characters of a mother Mm -hmm. uh, in the Bible uh, many times and also the character of a father. So, yeah. I don't know where I was supposed to go with that right now. Uh, My brain just stopped. But (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry, but yeah. No, 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 of course. And I think, I mean, that's not unsurprising given the foundation that she starts with, which is that both uh, men and women are made in the image of God. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, obviously true. That's def- that's obviously a point of common ground between us and her answer here. Um, and so it's un- com- it's completely unsurprising that God would decide to use uh, masculine metaphors or pictures for us to understand him better, and he would use motherly, feminine uh, pictures sometimes in the Bible to yeah. communicate his attributes. Um Don Christine's point is definitely overwhelmingly so more masculine and referring to God as things like father and um, things like that. Um, but there are, you know, she kind of makes this point a little bit where there are some metaphors. I mean, there's there's a there's a passage in Hosea where God talks about he's like a mother hen, mm-hmm. right? Like gathering his chicks. Um, Jesus talks about that in the New Testament as well. Yeah. So it's not... Um, uh, it's definitely not wrong for God to use those kinds of things, uh, more feminine, motherly characteristics to describe his nature because both the nature of men and women come from God in the first place. Yeah, I think I think um, I don't want to import too much into the conversation that is that is not in the question or the answer that um, the bishop gives. But I think that we sometimes make this move that is unjustified, which is we rightly point out 
God is not a gendered creature. God, mm-hmm. God transcends gender, sex, male, female. However, like, listen, I'm not going to take a position right now on, on all of that. Whatever, however you conceive of those things, God transcends them all. Yeah. Um, and I, then I, so, and I think that's, I think that's true. That's true, and it's good. And we recognize that God transcends all of that, and He's created us in a way that does not transcend all of that. Mm-hmm. But secondly, I, the, the the move that we make that I think is, is bad is we therefore say that God is all of those things. Right. Or it's, it's to say that God is neither male nor female mm-hmm. is not the same as saying God is both male and female. Right. Those, exactly. are, those are different things. And I think we're wise to understand God as neither male nor female than we are to try and understand him as both male and female. Because the first category is unsexed, non-sexed. And the other one is multi or ambi sex, or I don't even know if that's the right word, um, which I don't think, which is to, uh, it's a very human impulse, I think, to conceive of God as something like an, a perfected human. Mm-hmm. So it's like, no, God's like a human, but he has all of the sexual characteristics. So sometimes he's a father and sometimes he's a mother and all the, and all of those things that are good in all of humanity. God is the maximal re- reflection of all of those. I think that's, uh, it's not untrue, but it's not perfectly true. Mm-hmm. What's true rather is that God has, you put it really well earlier, Jacob. It's like all goodness is mm-hmm. rooted in God. Yeah. And so it, whatever is ma- is good and masculine mm-hmm. finds its source in God Almighty. And whatever is good and feminine mm-hmm. or whatever is good and male and female, whatever, again, I'm not, the point is not what are the right sexual categories right. and, or, or it's not, we're not talking about that, but whatever it is about maleness, femaleness, masculinity, femininity, is God a boy or a girl? The right answer is he's neither, not he's both. Exactly. And we make, yeah. we make the move from he's neither, therefore he's both. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the wrong way to think of it. We don't say, and we don't say he's both because, some, because he called himself a mother hen who is who's protecting her chicks under his wings yeah. or under her wings, I guess. Yeah. So, so see, therefore God's feminine too. No, 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 no. God mm-hmm. is the source. And, some of, and whatever goodness we see among the genders, sexes, et cetera, in humanity, mm-hmm. all finds its root in God who is who transcends the, those categories altogether. Yeah, absolutely. So hundred percent agree. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I think she addresses, uh, she lays a good foundation for that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that thing that, uh, we all just talked about, that's the, what you just said. Literally mm-hmm. the last thing you said is never said right. here in this chapter. Um, and, uh, I mean, I kind of, I kind of felt myself longing for that. Uh, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Cause I get into, I have these conversations with Mormons sometimes and people who believe that God is specifically gendered as a male. Um, and there are other people that, you know, have this kind of, uh, conception of God. And I mean, God is neither. And it does mm-hmm. not follow that. Therefore he's both or that he's all the genders. Right. Gender is literally God's idea. Like asking if God's a boy or a girl is kind of like asking, is this chair a boy or a girl? There's, mm-hmm. Gender is not a category that applies to a chair. And I don't think gender is really a category that you could... Gender is not a box you can put God in. Right. Because he created the box. He, right. He's the one who created gender. It's his idea. Right. And, and to so, the, yeah. to, so however you conceive yeah. of it, to the extent that gender and sex are real features of mm. the actual world, they didn't exist until God instantiated them right. apart from himself. Right. Mm-hmm. So it follows from or comes after... God's existence and is part of God's creation. And so it'd be wrong for us. And this is true of lots of qualities we see in the world. It's wrong of us to then try and shine those back on God, like a spotlight and try and understand him in terms of categories that apply just to us. Mm -hmm. Excellent. On Christine, did you have any closing thoughts on this uh, question? Mm, No, not specific, but uh, I didn't understand one thing you said because uh, you said that she doesn't say anything about what Cameron said that uh, Mm -hmm. if he's uh, uh, no gender, he is both. Because I feel like in the first, uh, is it paragraph? No, Mm -hmm. first, yeah, Mm -hmm. paragraph in the last sentence, Mm -hmm. she is saying that God is uh, neither. yeah, neither mm, one nor the one other, other, but both but he both and she. He yeah. and she. So right. I feel she is saying that it 
it, God is he and she at the same time. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't want me, to take it too strongly on maybe that sentence. I, but, yeah, but well, maybe I misunderstood you and what you also were saying. Well, they, first but, of all, thank you for reading that because that is what she says and that's, that's what Cameron was addressing absolutely. Uh, I was more talking about how uh, she doesn't talk about how God transcends the idea of gender altogether, that yeah, gender is okay. his idea. And yeah. so, I, so God can't be put in the box of gender because okay. it's his yeah. idea he created. That's what I was saying. But yeah. thank you for but reading that. I, but I think, I think no. you're right on, Christine. Yeah. I think she mm. does make that sort of mistake, if I'm going to translate it on the fly. Yeah. Something, uh, <laughs> this means that girls and boys are both God's God-like image. in God's, mm. or in the image of God. Yeah. And that God is neither one nor the other, but both he and she. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's the bad move to say God is neither one nor the other. Therefore, he's mm. both. Mm. Um, I think there should be a strong separation between those things. It does not follow that because he's neither, he's both. So yeah. men, and, men and women, male and female, whatever, again, however you conceive of that, are both reflect the image of God mm-hmm. and are both therefore valuable and part of his design, et cetera. That doesn't mean God is both. All right, excellent. Uh, how about we go ahead and move on to the next one? Because yeah. I actually think uh, this next one, there's a lot of positives to say, mm-hmm. actually. I'm going to toss it to Aunt Christine to uh, talk about. But this next question is, uh, why did God make mosquitoes? What are they good for? I think that that's a pretty great question. That's yeah. definitely a question you'd expect. That c- Kind of similar to like uh, something we said earlier. I can see that this question can be expanded and like and can touch on lots of different mm-hmm. things about like suffering and, and all those things. Um, but I'm actually happy I wasn't asked it because she actually answers it in a unique way that I might have not uh, come up with on the fly. And I actually think it has some good things to say about it. So anyways, Aunt Christine, how about you explain to us what her answer is to this question? Yeah. Uh, first of all, sh- uh, she is saying that uh, the... Um Mosquitoes, it's uh, a part of uh, everyone. Uh, no, every, everyone, everything. <laughs> like yeah. it is uh, supposed to be there, but we don't understand why because we just feel uh, it is uh, in the way or we are getting bitten. It, it uh, comes with uh, Ebola yeah. uh, and the stuff like that. So many mm-hmm. dies of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then she says that uh, she's uh, talked to a friend of her that knows uh, this better than she does. And I think that's really, cl- really clever. Uh, and, that, uh, uh, and then she says like the mosquito is good for uh, other um, uh, cre- uh, creatures mm-hmm. like uh, bats and uh, spiders and stuff like that mm-hmm. because they eat them. And uh, also it is... Uh, uh, like the um, man mosquito, mm-hmm. is it that? Is yeah. it called? Yeah, the, uh, the male mosquito. Yeah, it's uh, um, helping with the pol- like yeah, to pollinate, pol- pollinate the pollinating plants. Yeah. Uh, plants, and that is good things. Mm-hmm. Like uh, it is good for something, and then she uh, like take the line to uh, human and mm. ask, okay, but maybe the mosquito is asking what are so good about humans? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because humans also does many bad things, but we also do good and mm. uh, that God has created also us and are um, and uh, like us for mm-hmm. that. So... Yeah, I think that's really good answer, and I wouldn't uh, have thought of it either mm-hmm. if I got have gotten that question like on the spot. But uh, yeah, I like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm reminded of kind of the the way that God answers Job. Mm. I mean, God's answer to Job is something like just showing him all of the things he's never considered and can't imagine, and doesn't he, like it's telling Job, "You don't see the whole picture." So. So don't, you're trying to figure out one little portion of the picture and you don't have the whole picture. So trust me, I'm in charge of the universe, something like that. And so I'm reminded by this answer of something like that. Where it's like, listen, uh, humanity is not the only thing happening in the world. Mm-hmm. And we are so quick as humans to um, look at the world and think that we have it figured out. And we wildly, I mean, by orders of magnitude, we wildly underestimate 
the complexity of everything. Mm-hmm. And so, in, so um, all that is to say, I think that it helps. It was um, a good answer for for that impulse where I want to. I'm the one who wants to give an answer. Well, did you know actually mosquitoes are good for da 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 da? And give the answer. Mm-hmm. And she's more like, where were you when the earth was made? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And here are some good things. And maybe the mosquitoes wonder the same thing. Because I don't know if you know this, but mosquitoes are responsible for the death of half of all humanity that's ever lived. Mm. They're, it's bad. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's bad, but it's, that's a troubling statistic. Sure. But maybe the mosquitoes are going, what did you make these people for? Look at God. What are you doing? Right, right. Like, look at, how, look at how many gazillions of us they kill and whatever. So, of course... Mosquitoes are not the spiritual center of the universe, and humanity sure. has a different relationship with God and a different plant part of creation. And we're in, we're made in God's image, unlike the mosquitoes. However, I love the shift of the perspective, yeah, hmm. because I think it encourages us to take seriously the complexity and design. Like God's got it all worked out; He's doing universe business. You guys handle the humanity business, mm-hmm. and to that end, it I think challenges us to do the humanity business well. Right. So it's like, okay, mosquitoes could rightly condemn humanity for our immorality. So humans, you be worried about that. Yeah, and I think it's perfect. I, one of the things I really like about it is it kind of gets, it touches on a principle that we've talked about on the podcast before, where it's like when we're evangelizing to somebody, like how do we get to the gospel? Mm-hmm. Like how, how do we take their question that might be apologetic related or apologetic adjacent and how do we answer it in a way that gets us closer to the gospel and sharing the gospel with them? Yeah. I think this does it like just really perfectly. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you think what's wrong with the world is that there are mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's not what's wrong with the world. What's wrong with the world is that there are humans who destroy everything. Yeah, they, they, cursed, they do. We cursed the universe in our disobedience. Yeah. The, her, her, th- her language here is we, we do destructive things. Yeah. We do destructive things. And so you probably have like a mosquito or something that does do uh, destructive things, uh, especially as a result of the curse. And uh, the mosquito probably asks, what are all these humans doing around? Do mm-hmm. you see what these humans are doing to the world? And I just think like, oh man, that's actually a really clever way yeah. to answer the question in a way that could get us to the gospel quickly with whoever yeah. asked this. I remember Clay Jones uh, talking once and he was talking about how after Adam and Eve sinned, what the angels must have been thinking. And I was yeah. like, you can't let these things reproduce. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, very good. So I mean, I think I mean this question gets a gold. This answer gives a gold star for me. Yeah. I, I thought it was really good, and uh, actually yeah, really clever. Obviously, lots more to be said, but I don't criticize it for not being as for not being an entire treatise. I think it's I think it's good as far as it goes, and I think it helps to frame the concern in a helpful way. Absolutely. Uh, let's move on to the last one. This will be uh, the question that'll end our time for today. Um, the question is: What is sin for you? So clearly um, formulated in a very personal way. I'm sure she was definitely asked this. Absolutely. What is sin for you? But uh, who wants to take, I have no opinion on which one of you talks about this first, but so what is her answer? I'll go. So the question is, what is sin for you? Mm -hmm. And her answer is for me, sin is everything that threatens life, the creation and that which is good. And I think this is a significant foundational flaw in the book and mm. the answers to the rest of the questions, because I think that is a very lacking definition of what sin is. I guess you could just say sin is everything that is opposed to that, which is good and good is defined by the character of God. And that, mm. that would be okay. And then there's more to say about it, but I think she goes on to describe what is sin, what, what is sin and talking about what is sinful in terms of things that are bad for humanity mm-hmm. I should say what I appreciate about that. I'll say what I appreciate about it after I say what I don't appreciate. But she locates the definition of sin in the experience of humankind. Mm-hmm. But the, defi- the definition of sin is rooted in God and his nature and God's experience, not in ours. And so this is not a biblical definition of sin. And I think it's important as Christians, it's when it becomes easy to talk about sin, it's like you've broken God's rules and that is mm-hmm. totally disconnected from human life and experience. I think that's, that's not altogether that helpful because we forget that God's commands are what are good for us. Just like, just like my children, when they, right? When they do something bad, it's not just that I have arbitrary rules for them and they have broken the rules and therefore I'm mad. 
And it's like, no, no, my, I'm trying to, my responsibility to my children is that they would grow and mature and become mm-hmm. complete and thriving human beings. Mm-hmm. And when they fail to do that, it's bad for them. So the reason we have rules is so that they can have a life ultimately that's abundant and thriving. And that's what God wants for us also. So I think it's good to, we shouldn't just throw away human experience as though God has, there's like this divine list and you have to keep it or God's mad at you. Right. But no, the, the rules that God has for us are rooted in what is good for us. And he designed us and he knows better than we do what's, what's good for us. However, the nature of sin is not found merely, exclusively, primarily in what is bad for humanity. Mm-hmm. It's true that sin is bad for humanity, but that's not his definition. Sin is rooted in the character and nature of God. And um, there's lots to say. Like we could write sure. their books have been written on sin, homardiology, the theologians call it, mm. um, on sin and sin and sinfulness. Mm-hmm. But sin is, scriptures uh, conceives of sin as when we fail to do what is righteous and when we accomplish what is evil. And she doesn't exactly really say that. Oh, and, but both of those things from God's perspective, and mm-hmm. he can't be wrong about it. So I think this is going to be a crack in the foundation that causes problems for the answers to questions to come. Yeah. And I think it's a serious, serious um, weakness in effectively communicating the gospel and the Christian worldview. Mm-hmm. Before I say the 800 things I want to say about it, uh, do you concur on Christine? Or? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I feel that's some really good points. And um, uh, yeah, that she's uh, talking out of, first of all, what she thinks, and that was the question. Mm-hmm. But again, the question should have been just what is sin mm. uh, and not for you because uh, then you are taking God out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. It is, or how she answered it, it has nothing to do about God, but right. sin has or all nothing, to do about God. Or who, Right, who and there's is. nothing outside of herself. So what is sin for you? The question should be, what is sin? Because what's sin for me is sin for you also. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's what is sin and why, why is it good or bad or true or false or should we do it or avoid it or whatever? Like that's where the question is. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I interrupted you. That no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So uh, first of, or that's the first. And second, I feel like she is trying, like in the end of chapter, uh, she is trying to say that uh, everybody is sinners, it seems mm-hmm. like. Uh, but she also says, but... Or I feel like when I read it, uh, she is saying, but that's fine because God loves you anyways. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yes, God loves you, but uh, not, uh, or how do you say this in English? Like, I just have to think. Um, Also, på trots av. Oh gosh. In spite of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, God loves us in spite of uh, mm-hmm. what we do. Uh, so he yeah. calls us to uh, change from the old yeah. and uh, be new in him and follow him. Well, it's like God loves us even though, God says to us, I love you, even though you hurt yourself and you hurt each other. Right. But God's saying, I love you even though you hurt me and yeah. you're at war against me and you've made yourself an enemy against me. Mm. And that's that's where the root of it is. It's true that we hurt our creation and we hurt each other and we hurt ourselves. That's all true. Mm-hmm. Um, but the main point is that we've aff- that in sin we offend God and His holiness and His perfection and disqualify ourselves from relationship with Him. So just yeah, I'm sorry, I've got a lot to say, but I'm yeah, not yeah. going to because we, I could go for way too long. Right. Yeah. Well, so I wanted to, I wanted to speak to what you were just talking about, on Christine. So the last words of this chapter. Um, talk about how God uh, loves us, his, uh, his love and grace for us, uh, exactly as we are. Um, uh, we hear this a lot, right? That God mm-hmm. loves us as we are. Now, that sentence is true right. if you get the subject right. Mm. So, that, so when we say God loves you as you are, that is a sentence about God. Right. It's about God That's and not about, about you. about who God is and not about who you are. So when we say God loves us as we are, that's talking about God's grace, 
his love, his mercy, that he wants to forgive, that he wants to show grace, he wants to show mercy, and he mm-hmm. will. He makes he makes every effort to do that. Um, it's not because we're so awesome. It's right. not because you're perfect just the way you are. No, it's because God is perfect the way He is. Yeah, and therefore and he, you're valuable to Him, and we're valuable to Him because of that. Yes. Yeah, and I and I mean, I get the impression. I can't. I can't speak to her motivations, but I get the impression that the subject, when she says this, is us. Mm. That God loves us the way we are. She's talking about us. She's like, listen, everybody's kind of what you said on Christine. Everybody sins. We're, you know, no one's perfect, right? So I mean, God just loves us the way we are. Um, God does love us the way we are, but He calls us to holiness. He wants yeah. to transform us, right? I mean, the Bible. The Bible I'm says, imagining my relationship with my girls. Yeah. So I love them just as they are. And I would lay down my life. I think I would lay down my life for them. I believe about myself that I would. Mm-hmm. But I would give them everything. Mm-hmm. And I love them just as they are. And their own goodness is no factor in how, how much I love them. Right. But that doesn't mean that I think they're done. And that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that, you know, they're little kids. I don't kick them out of the house and say, you're a complete and mature human being now. Now go live. You have all of the tools that you need. It's like, no, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm raising them and I'm teaching them and I want them to grow and mature. And they're, they're incomplete. They're, they're, not, they're, they're, um, they're not fulfilled yet. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, as, a, as a parent, that's my responsibility to help, the, to, help to raise them, right? And, and my children have not risen yet. Uh, and so I know that that's just maybe a small understanding of maybe God's relationship with us and how he loves us where we are. It's like what we've done or haven't done just doesn't matter with respect to how much he loves us. But that also doesn't mean that he's satisfied with who we are at this moment. And he has a better plan where, you know, we're right now we're living according uh, in your, before we went, before a person is saved, you're living according to a fallen sinful nature Mm -hmm. where the things that you love and desire are, are bad for you. And you're living out of accord with the nature that uh, the nature and plan and the abundant life that God has in mind for you, and He wants to, uh, He wants you to be reborn and to be made new and walk according to your true, um, your royal, your eternally royal nature as a child of God in God's family. And we continue to love sinful things that are that are bad for us. Yeah, I mean that, but that understanding is is. Um, is necessary to to accurately answer the question. Right. Not just not just what sin is for you, right? But what sin is in general and for everybody. I mean, I mean, it's so vital. I mean, I think that it's really hard for me to even conceive of answering this question, whether or not it's directly personal or whether it's ge- in general or either way. It's hard for me to imagine answering this question any other way than fir- than first talking about the the nature in which it harms our relationship with God right? in the fact that sin is rebellion against God. That has to be the foundation. Right. It's something con- you said before, Cam, I, yeah. that I really appreciate the way you put it, is that people tend to uh, only get one important part of the story, and it's the least important part. Mm. So if, if what's part of the sin story is, yeah, it's rebellion against God and that it destroys the creation and our relationships with people. Both of those are important. Mm-hmm. But as Christians, I think we have really good reason to understand or recognize immediately which one is more important. Yeah. Obviously, which one is more important is how it affects our relationship with God mm-hmm. and how we're actually just all idolaters and, and, and rebel against God. So, yeah. So, the answer yeah. that we get here is something like sin is stuff that harms the creation, which I think is like what we've talked about before, like pointing mm-hmm. at the moon and staring at my finger. Sure, sure. It's like, uh, Yes, sin harms creation because it's disordered from God's uh, from God's perfect design and order. It's it's it, mm-hmm. because it because it violates God's perfection and it's disordered. It, it hurts the creation, but that's not the definition of sin. The definition of sin is found within it hurts the creator, not not its effect on creation, but its um, dissociation from the nature of the creator. And I think that's where we should locate sin. And I think that I think we make a lot of mistakes in our moral judgments and our ethical arguments and things when we conceive of sin or we conceive even of morality as the things which hurt me or hurt someone else or we think of them in terms of harm to the creation yeah. or at least exclusively in those terms. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. 
I think we got to land there for today. We went a little bit long, but that's okay. I know you guys don't mind. Um, and so we'll go ahead and continue this next time. Uh, we hope for this to be a reoccurring thing, God willing. And I hope. And on Christine willing. And on Christine Willing, willing. yes, yeah. of course. We will, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for listening. Uh, we hope that you stay tuned for the next episode of Word First Radio and for the next installment in this series, Going Through This Book. Thank you for listening. God bless. Thank you for listening to Word First Radio. Be sure to like, subscribe, and check us out online at wordfirst.us. Yeah.